Good morning. It's good to be back with you. I think the last time we were here was Advent of 2017, and Mariah hooked us into speaking that Sunday as well. Um, Mary and I are on a three-month speaking tour around uh, North America. We spent a week in Canada at the beginning of our trip, and we will be all over the place over the next uh, number of weeks. We are um, wrapping up our time as mission workers with Mennonite Mission Network. Um, and so we're, we're visiting a number of our supporting churches and, um, and saying goodbye. Um, we, we began in 1990 with Eastern Mennonite Missions as church planters and peace missioners. Um, and then somewhere along the line, we joined with Mennonite Mission Network. Um, we were dual, and then we were solely with Mennonite Mission Network. But in 1990, in June of 1990, we had a very big day in a very small place. Uh, Petticodiac Mennonite Church is one of the only Mennonite churches in the Maritime Provinces of Canada. And that Sunday, they now call it Hearst Sunday, uh, Mary and I were ordained and taken into the church. Our oldest son was baptized, and we were commissioned and sent out to Australia as missionaries. Um, and I don't know if you can see in this picture the little girl who's being blessed and has one eye open and one eye closed. Um, she's your worship leader today. Um, We've lived in six different locations in Australia over the past 29 years. Somewhere along the line, we became Australian citizens. Our children grew up, went to university, and entered into careers of their own as pastors and teachers in the broader Mennonite church. Um, our oldest son is a professor here at, uh, in Harrisonburg at EMU. Our middle son is being ordained this afternoon at Weaver's and then is off to Heston to be the new campus pastor at Heston College. And as I said, our daughter is your worship leader this morning. Um, and then we also have, I think, a picture of our, the whole family that got together. So we're retiring um, from the mission board. Recently, we retired uh, from nine years of being pastors at Avalon Baptist Peace Memorial Church. Uh, and we made a move from the coast of Sydney where we could see and hear the ocean, two and a half hour drive west where we're now, we went from sea level to where now we're a kilometer high and we're in the mountains. Um, we're still continuing to work as pastors for the Anabaptist Association of Australia and New Zealand, and we will continue that in our new location. We've moved to the western edge of the Blue Mountains west of Sydney to support a young family starting what they hope will become an Anabaptist community called uh, the Milk and Honey Farm. We move close to our friends into a large house on an 87.4 acre property called Magpie Hollow. This is a huge house with six bedrooms and six en suites. And as soon as we saw it, we thought this would be a wonderful retreat space and a place to hold workshops. So we're renting this house, and uh, when we get back, we want to begin this ministry of hospitality and doing workshops. Now, Mary is a farm girl, so she feels right at home at this new location. But I, I grew up in the city, um, and I loved our time around the ocean. Um, and so a lot of our friends thought, how are you going to survive, you know, in the country, in the mountains, away from the ocean? I'm also an ocean swimmer. I, I compete in ocean races. So they said, how are you going to survive? But one of the things that I discovered is I'm loving where we are. Um, I also love the mountains. And I've, I've discovered, to my own surprise, uh, a new love of trees. And so that's, that's our focus this morning, to talk about trees. We have so many different trees on our property. Um, and Mary, when we would go walks where we were living before, Mary would talk to trees and she would touch trees. And um, it would slow up the walks all the time because of her 
interaction with the trees. But I'm, I haven't reached that stage, but I have gained this new appre appreciation of trees, and it's been a bit of a surprise for me. But if you listen to Aboriginal people around the world, they've always understood trees to be part of the community, not just things out there, but members of the community. Um, they're part of their, in Australia, they would say they're part of their mob, part of the human world and active members of our communities with lives, loves, and feelings. One Australian Aboriginal wrote, trees provide us with inspiration for our art and give us the aesthetic of the landscape. When the invading British, as one of their first acts on our country, cut them down, we wept and cried with the trees sharing their pain and shielding them with our bodies. When we destroy trees, we destroy ourselves. We cannot survive in a treeless world. A recent newspaper article in Australia was entitled, The Government Wants to Bulldoze My Inheritance, 800-Year-Old Sacred Trees. The trees are being removed to put in a new road. The Aboriginal author says, to sit in a tree that saw your people birthed, massacred, and now resist is a feeling that the English language will never be able to capture. This proposed road is meant to save drivers two minutes in their travel. The author asked, what is two minutes to 800 years? He continues, these trees are my inheritance, our inheritance. Their survival and our fight to keep them alive and safe are a cultural obligation and an assertion of our sovereignty. This sovereignty is a threat to the state. Now, recently, the Western world moved quickly to raise millions of dollars to rebuild the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, a Western sacred site. But we continue to destroy Aboriginal sacred sites worldwide. Reading this news article, I was reminded of how Palestinian olive groves today are being repeatedly bulldozed by Israeli occupiers. And yet, destroying trees is a form of warfare as old as the Bible itself. Deuteronomy 20 lays out some rules for warfare for ancient Israel. And included in these instructions is this. If you besiege a town for a long time, making war against it in order to take it, you must not destroy its trees by wielding an ax against them. Although you may take food from them, you must not cut them down. Are trees in the field human beings that, you should, com that should come under siege from you? You may destroy only the trees that you know do not produce food. You may cut them down for use in building siege works against the town that makes war with you until it falls. Now, the majority of Jewish commentators that I read interpret the words, are trees in the field human, not as a rhetorical question, but as a statement stressing the relationship or similarity between trees and humans. In Jewish sources, it appears that the only natural object to which humankind is collectively compared is the fruit-producing tree of Deuteronomy 20:19. An 11th century Jewish authority said that since the tree is not an enemy, we have no right to destroy it or make it suffer because of disputes between human beings. Another 10th century sage read the same verse to mean that we must not cut down trees for man is the tree of the field. That is, our lives as human beings depend on trees. By either interpretation, one might expect religious Jews to respect olive trees owned and cultivated by human beings who, though not Jewish, were created in the image of God. Yet religious Jews are the most frequent perpetrators of terror attacks on trees that are used neither as bulwarks nor as cover for would-be snipers, but as sustenance for Palestinian life and livelihood. One reported incident in 2015 involved over 1,000 olive and almond trees. Palestinian leaders accused Israel of a war crime. The government response was, today was carried out the eviction of an illegal inv invasion of around 1,000 olive trees planted illegally without permits. 
according to one source as of October 2013, and, and these statistics have gotten worse over the years, but this one said more than 800,000 trees were uprooted with $12.3 million lost each year by the 80,000 families depending on the olive forest harvest. In an April article in the Washington Post by the author of the book, Reforesting Faith, What Trees Teach Us About the Nature of God and His Love for Us, it said this, trees are mentioned more times in the Bible than any living thing other than God and people. There is a tree on the first and last page of the Bible, and one stands by every important character and theological event in Scripture. For those willing to bet their grandchildren's futures on Jesus' imminent return, recall that the trees of the forest shout for joy when God returns to destroy the destroyers of the earth. When Jesus does return, trees will finally get their day in court and they know the judgment will come down in their favor. Now, one of the first parables in the Bible involves trees, and it's not a story told by Jesus. It's a story found in Judges 9. And if you have your Bibles with you, you may want to turn to this because I want to spend some time looking at this parable. But Judges is one of those books that I think is, is very contemporary. The last verse in the book of Judges says, in those days there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. And I read that this week and I thought, that's populism gone wild. And that's what the world that we're living in, particularly the Western world that we're living in. So how contemporary is this book of Judges? And I, <clears throat> I read this parable and I thought, wow, this says so much to us today in our, in our setting. It's, it's a story that's found um, talking about Gideon's sons. And after Gideon was gone, what was going to happen? The record of Gideon's achievements is dominated by his defeat of the Midianites. But he also deserves notoriety for his paternal accomplishments as well. Seventy sons not to mention daughters and children born to his concubines. So he was out making war, but he was also spending a lot of time at home, it sounds like. After his victory over the Midianites, the elders of Israel tempted Gideon with position, power, and prestige. They came to him and they said, rule over us, both you, your son, and your grandson, since you have rescued us from the power of Midian. But Gideon was a rare character who said, I will not rule over you, neither will my son. Yahweh shall rule over you. His response gives a rare glimpse of the character of a man who is not motivated by the promise of position or power. Gideon's response to the elders of Israel provides a critical lead in to the parable of Judges 9, which begins with a conversation between one of Gideon's sons, Abimelech, by a Shechemite concubine and his maternal family. After struggling with the frustration of his ambition to become the principal leader, he asks the question of his audience, and in it reveals the source of his frustration. Abimelech, son of Jeroboam, or Gideon, went to Shechem to his uncles and all his mother's relatives and said to them, Ask, <clears throat> excuse me, Ask all the leading men of Shechem, what do you think is best, that 70 men rule over you, all those sons of Gideon, or that one man rule? You'll remember that I am your own flesh and blood. Uh, an aside here, we, we look at the Democratic um, lineup of candidates right now, 20-some. This Abimelech had 70 people in front of him, uh, and he thought, he wanted to rule, but he said, how am I ever going to do that? So he appeals to his family. I'm your own flesh and blood. Help me out of this. His desire to achieve rulership over Gideon's family was blocked by the fact that he was not among the 70 legitimate sons of Gideon, since he was a child of a concubine. And he was not the offspring of a legitimate wife. In addition, there were at least 70 options for the position vacated at Gideon's death, and all 70 were ahead of him. As long as any of these 70 sons remained alive, he had no chance of becoming ruler. 
His appeal to the Shechemites was supported by the flesh and blood connection of family ties. His mother's family provided both political and financial support that resulted in an ambush of Gideon's sons at Oprah, wherein all 70 were murdered on one stone, except for the youngest son, Jotham. Jotham, who hid himself and escaped the slaughter. The attitude of Oblimelech reveals a ruthlessness toward his brothers that brings into question the flesh and blood argument he used to woo the Shechemites. It was his own flesh and blood that he murdered on the rock. Now Stan Patterson, a professor at Andrews University, says in a commentary on this passage, a dominance orientation is always rooted in an exaggerated opinion of self and a marginalization of others. It opens the door for coercive behavior that engenders fear and force limited only in terms of what the character of the person will allow. In his bid for dominance, Ablimelech's character allowed the most extreme coercion, deception and murder. The reward was his coronation beside the oak of the pillar, which is at Shechem, maybe a Jewish sacred site, and the title of king. Now, Jotham's response was both creative and courageous. In many ways, he was that prophet of the day. He was the truth teller to those in power. From Mount Gerizim, which faced Shechem from the southeast, his voice called Ablimelech and the Shechemites to account before God for their treachery. And like a good prophet, he tells a story. He says, once the trees went forth to anoint a king over them, and they said to the olive tree, reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, shall I leave my fatness with which God and men are honored and go stand and sway over the trees? Then the tree said to the fig tree, you come reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, shall I leave my sweetness and my good fruit and go and sway over the trees? Then the tree said to the vine, you come reign over us. But the vine said to them, shall I leave my new wine which cheers God and men and go and sway over the trees? Finally, all the trees said to the thorn bush, you come reign over us. And the thorn bush said to the trees, if in truth you are anointing me as king over you, come and shelter in my shade. But if not, may fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. After this, Jotham goes on to say to the leaders of Shechem and to Oblimelech, you deserve each other. And he said, if what you did was a good thing in killing these 70 brothers of mine, well then, may God bless you. But if it wasn't, he essentially said, then you can all go to hell. He said, let fire consume you. And if you go on and read the story, that's exactly what happens. They, they have a falling out and there's a burning up of a tower and they destroy each other. But I want to look at this parable and see what it can teach us today. The tree is a common metaphor for Israel and is here used in a most creative manner. The trees that go seeking a king are not identified as a species until the very end of the parable where they become the victims of the thorn bushes treachery. Knowing the species of the trees desiring a king is necessary for a clear understanding of Jotham's intended message. For the first tree approach is the olive tree. The second is the fig. Third is a non-tree, the grapevine, and finally the thorn bush. And one of the reasons that I like this parable is where we're living now, we have all of these on our property. So this parable has come alive for, for me. All are significantly smaller than the cedar of Lebanon and thus incapable of fulfilling the request to reign over or sway over the cedar by virtue of their relative size. The olive and fig both refuse the request for advancement on the basis of a clear recognition of their calling and personal satisfaction coming from the product their services provide. The move away from the realm of tree addresses Ablimelech's lack of formal son status, which disqualifies him from service as the primary leader to replace Gideon. The vine, though not a tree, 
reveals wisdom common to both of the previous candidates. All three knew what they were created for and were not successfully tempted to covet a role that was not theirs in order to gain power and glory of position. The thorn bush or bramble was a different sort of candidate. The thorn bush was lying in wait for an opportunity to dominate and rule. The thorn bush certainly has a legitimate purpose in the ecology of God's creation, but that purpose is not attended by the prestige of public honor that is granted to the olive, the fig, the vine, or the cedar of Lebanon. Our time living in Atlanta, Georgia in the early 1980s when we worked for Mennonite Central Committee introduced us to the kudzu plant. And I'm reminded when I read about this thorn bush or this pr bramble bush of kudzu. While certainly not the species referenced in Judges 9, without doubt kudzu qualifies as a pesky plant of the highest order. It is opportunistic and voracious in its quest for dominance. It can grow as much as three feet on a warm summer day. People used to tell us, if you stand here long enough and watch this kudzu plant, you can see it grow. And it has the capacity to cover and kill trees by dominating the source of sunlight so completely that the tree starves. The thorn bush or bramble, regardless of species, provides no possibility of symbiotic advantage to the tree. The thorn bush readily accepted the offer of kingship and just as readily followed with a threat of coercive dominance. A paraphrase of this response might be, yes, I will do it. In fact, if you don't allow me to sway over you and be king, I will personally destroy you by fire. This eager acceptance and subsequent threat are both empty and shelter a tragic lie. For the truth is that dominant coercive leadership brings decay and death. The tree that shelters under the thorn bush would never have suffered the promised fire, but it would have entered into a re leadership relationship resulting in death. There are thousands of trees in the southeastern part of the United States that appear lush and green and healthy, but actually stand dead beneath the leaves of the kudzu vine. Now, Abimelech ruled Israel for three years, but is appropriately, appropriately not remembered as Israel's first king. He was betrayed and died at the hands of his own flesh and blood relatives, the Shechemites. He was, he was hit by a millstone thrown by a woman, and he was so horrified that his legacy might be that he was killed by a woman that he said to his bodyguard, you know, thrust me through with your sword so it won't be known that I was killed by a woman. But somehow the biblical writer got that story in there. So he'll always be remembered as being killed by a woman. What a shame. You know. um, the Jotham who escaped into exile does not reappear in the biblical record, but his brief appearance in the parable of the trees provides a powerful testimony and insight into the danger posed by the self-centered leader who aims at ascending to power and position with dominance. Now, how shall we apply this parable to our present setting? What does it say about leadership in the church, leadership in the community, and leadership in the country? Now, I won't spin that out for you. I'll let you chew on that. Um, but I do want to make one application from our setting down under. Earlier this year, we were in New Zealand when an Australian gunman attacked two mosques and killed and injured quite a few people. Um, it was New Zealand's 9-11. Um, people were just wandering around in shock. One, one person said to us, you're an American, how do you handle these things? And we don't have any answers to these, these kind of atrocities either. But the tragedy, this tragedy dominated the news and people's conversations for weeks. But one clear story emerged involving leadership. The New Zealand Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, did an excellent job of leading her country through the horrors that shocked the whole nation and the world. Chris Marshall, who is a biblical scholar and restorative justice practitioner um, in New Zealand and also a member of our Anabaptist network, wrote this. 
He said Jacinda is being hailed around the world as a beacon of hope for a new kind of political leadership. It is hard for New Zealanders not to feel a sense of pride in her performance, and a pride also that our small country, notwithstanding its own entrenched injustices, has spawned a female leader of such caliber, courage, and compassion. In an international arena increasingly dominated by thugs, bullies, strongmen, Jacinda Ardern has provided a masterclass in what I call compassionate justice. He examines why Jacinda's response was so different than many other leaders and quotes another author who puts it down to love. And I found out recently that Jacinda was raised as a Mormon. And so she had this ethical upbringing um, and had this love as, as a basis. She, she's left the Mormon church, but I think she still carries with it some of that ethical um, background and undergirding. But this author said it was Jacinda's display of authentic love that makes her example so difficult for other po politicians to emulate. For it is not just what Jacinda did, but how she did it that was crucial. The gift of support she gave to those traumatized by the massacre was imbued with the spirit in which she offered it. And without that spirit, without that sincerely felt love, her gift would not have had its restorative power. None of this, Chris Marshall writes, is to imply that Jacinda is a saint or a superhuman, quite the opposite. The reason why she has had such an astonishing impact on millions of people here and around the world devastated by the massacre is because she responded in such a genuinely human way, a way that allowed compassion rather than political calculation to guide her actions. May we all be people who are grounded and planted in that compassion and love that God provides. May we be people who allow compassion and love to rule in our lives and be the first response when something happens. That passage, the Old Testament passage that was read today, was a curse and a blessing. A curse to those who follow people and not God, and then a blessing to those who follow God. Let me read that blessing again. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. It shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. Let me close with a prayer. Like a tree planted by living water is the person who commits to your ways, O Lord. Nourish us with your disciplining love. Prune our branches for growth. Teach us also to recognize good fruit and to recoil from the bitterness of the bad. Amen.